Well, hello. We're uh, here live in Vancouver for the uh, Global Congress at AGL. We have Dr. John Lenahan, who's been uh, gracious enough to join us, and we're going to have a discussion about the future of robotic surgery. You bet. <laughs> it's future. So, John, yeah. uh, tell us just a little bit about your background. Uh, well, I'm a, a long-standing ob -GYN member of the society since the early 80s. Uh, and have focused on mentally invasive surgery for the last 20 years, 25 years, uh, and robotics almost exclusively since 2005. Uh, and my um, role now, I'm semi-retired and working on simulation. I'm still my passion is simulation and training, and, and I think uh, robots really lend themselves to, to proper training. Uh, different than what we've always done, the see one, do one, teach one model. Now we can really use simulation to get people trained to do things the right way to proficiency before we let them practice on live patients. Yeah, proficiency breeds efficiency. Correct. And, I, and I've always said there's nothing particularly efficient about the robot, but it is a convenient excuse yeah. to implement an efficiency model. And right. There's a lot yeah, of and, and uh, today most residents, um, you know, with the shortened work hours and decreasing hysterectomies and all, they don't get enough experience in the residencies and 30% of them graduate not feeling comfortable to operate on their own, even even basic stuff, let alone very complex mentally invasive stuff. So so this, this training to proficiency with simulation where they can practice over and over and over again is gonna really help that problem. And that actually brings up one of the questions I have for you, the conundrum that we're going to have now with um, a number of other robotic systems coming online. Uh, some are here, some are coming. We'll give you a, have you give us a brief overview of, of several of those systems. The question I have uh, is we're in a, a place now where these residents are graduating, maybe doing 10, maybe 20 hysterectomies a year. We're requiring them to do 10 on a robot through our credentials at our hospitals right. if we're following national guidelines uh, that John helped create uh, or created. Um, in 2014 in, in the JMIG. And now we're gonna have this system and that system. You know, these these um, practicing physicians don't have 40 cases to split up between right. just robotic models. So how do we, you know, how do we troubleshoot that? That's a great question, Rick. Uh, and that's really an issue in my hospital now and a lot of other hospitals. You know, the, to, to, the robot, like unlike other forms of surgery, requires you do it a lot or you lose your skills. There's, there's a, a well-documented rapid skills degradation. So I, I think the, uh, the future of credentialing when we get out in the system, and, and uh, it's going to be several things. One, it's going to be platform independent. So it's, it's like, you know, how do we credential someone to do a hysterectomy? Whether which tool you use isn't all that important. If you're using robots, it's going to be a little higher standard. Like pilots, if you fly multi-engines, a little higher standard than a single engine. Kind okay. Of thing. All right. Uh, the second thing is that um, volume is part of it, but we, we know from several studies that even high-volume surgeons sometimes don't do as well as equally high-volume surgeons who have better skills. So practicing and getting skills up there is, is uh, shown to be important. Uh, the way we're going to do that, I, I, in my opinion, is a, is a combination of you know, actual cases, um, simulation, because you can get your uh, practice on procedure-based or skills-based simulation between cases out of the OR uh, that can be documented and sent up to your hospital committees and then video review of the cases you do to ensure that your skills are adequate. You can you can grade cases based on, on hand-eye skills with a score called, as you know, the gear score. Right. And uh, you can also grade it on were they doing it the right way, was it the right anatomy, are they, they doing the right thing for the patient. So uh, I think it's gonna be a combination of case volume with uh, additional simulation for people that have low volume with some video review for all and more for people with more volume that will enable them to, the hospital systems to ensure that people are, are doing the right thing, keeping their skills up. So we're going to have um, lean a little more heavily on technology, really, uh, for regulating um, quality right. than we have in the past. Um, with non-robotic platforms. Right, and we have to. And, and, and the other, you know, sort of the elephant in the room uh, is that, uh, you know, should everybody be doing this? Uh, and uh, again, you know and I know that there are long learning curves. Yeah. Uh, and the people who do this every day and do it a lot and have good teams, and the team's really important too, I didn't even mention that, yeah. um, get better results. They just do. And it's cheaper for the system and it's better for the patients. So maybe uh, every ob shouldn't be doing robotic surgery, just like now every ob doesn't do cancer surgery and every ob doesn't do sacral couple things. So I mean, there's 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 going to be a shifting of uh, how our specialty from one size fits all that we grew up into, you know, now you're going to be the person that does this and you should be the one doing this. Uh, 
you know, for example, I, I have a couple of patients I've seen with huge, big tumors, and they send them to me for robotic surgery, and they, they're just really not good candidates for robots. But I'm not that comfortable doing a big open case anymore because I haven't done those in years. So I that's send them nice. to my oncologist friend who does open cases. So. Okay. Well, that's great information. I'm going to switch gears real quick, right. and um, maybe in a, about a minute or two, uh, just review some of the new platforms coming online. And, and I guess uh, the way that I would position that is uh, what's currently available. Right. And um, you know, just kind of a brief review of what's coming online and um, uh, what the major difference is compared to are these uh, coming close to what we're currently using or are they, or are they not quite in the same mode? And, and I suppose, um, I mean, are there risks on them? Are the port sizes larger or smaller? Right, it, it, there's all the above. Okay. All right. So the, the current system, as everybody knows, is the DaVinci, which is on its fourth generation, which is really a Cadillac. I mean, it does very complex surgeries very well. The SIs are still out there, the third generation, which do normal surgeries very well. Um, there's the only other robot currently on the market is by Transenteryx, which is called the Senhan system. It's a it's a fancy laparoscope okay. with non-wristed instruments. It okay. does have open consoles. All the all the new systems are going to have open consoles uh, with 3D glasses or some kind of vision system. Uh, and the Senhance one is basically straight stick laparoscopy. So the robot, if I move my hand this way, the instrument goes that way. With the Senhance, I move my hand this way, the instrument goes that way. Uh -huh. Just like you have to think straight stick. Gotcha. So there's some training involved. Um, they are coming out with a new wristed version in the next year. Okay. Uh, and they uh, do have cool eye tracking. And some of the new systems, in addition to Senhance, where you, you sync your eyes with the robot and then you lift your eyes this way and that way and that way, and that's how you move the camera. The camera will follow your camera eyes. Camera will follow wow. your eyes. Okay. Now, if you move your head or look over here and then the camera goes over here so there's some bugs in that system okay All right. <laughs> the other new robots coming in the system <clears throat> they're 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 uh, coming from many countries okay uh, there are some that are very da Vinci like okay uh, big companies like Kawasaki which makes all the world's industrial robots uh, Medtronics which you know dominates our market with stapling and, and energy devices um, Johnson & Johnson Google verb have a partnership they're gonna make da Vinci like robots um, but they're going to have um, enhancements that make them cheaper, easier, and uh, like, for example, Medtronics will have a, a single tower that you can use for laparoscopy or robotics. Okay. And the camera can be used for laparoscopy or robotics. And okay. the instruments are the same instruments you use today in the OR. So they're looking at the value. They, they uh, say that their value proposition um, is going to be the same as same case-based cost as laparoscopy. Wow. A, normal, a normal hysterectomy today using the Da Vinci system with good efficiency runs uh, somewhere around 1000 to $1,500. Okay. Using uh, the Medtronics or a Senhance or the, the Metacroid, which is the Japanese one, it's probably going to be in the two to three hundred dollar range. Oh, so massive cost savings. So that's going to answer the whole value thing. Gotcha. Um, and so you have the two biggest uh, players really in medical medicine. health, right? Right. right. Uh, getting into the robot game. Getting into the robot. Uh, and what's what's the what do you think the impetus for that is? Are they seeing too much of their uh, procedures being eroded, or? Yes, they're uh, both of the uh, both Johnson and Johnson and uh, Medtronics make more money in a year on staples than Da Vinci makes in all its robots and service contracts and instruments and everything else. Okay. So they don't want to lose that market. Da Vinci has its own staplers now. It has its own vessel sealers now. They don't want to give that up. So they are they are building robots. The Google Verb Johnson & Johnson robot's going to come at it with a lot of data analytics, which okay. you would expect, with AI used to image procedures and actually figure out what makes a good, a good surgeon better, from how you throw your needle to where you grab your needle, things like that. Um, the Medtronics one is looking at case value, where they're going to be using reusable instruments and very modular units. Um, Kawasaki is uh, the world's, like I said, the world's biggest maker of automotive design robots. Gotcha. They're going into semi-autonomous surgery, so self-driving robots. And that's, they all want to get there. That's what's coming. Well, I guess that leads to the final question I have for you, John, is um, how far are we away? How far are we away from, uh, if not all, at least large portions of our surgeries being automated by virtue of the fact that there are enormous repositories of data where right. they're recording uh, best practices, how that translates to outcomes, and how soon or how far are we away from a robot being able to do the procedure better than we can? Uh, we're close. Wow. You know, you, you've seen the uh, cell phones have taken, once, once you hit that power curve and it goes up, it goes fast. And AI is growing by leaps and bounds. The computer companies are just 
you know, the chips they're making are fabulous and the repositories are good and the, the data they're getting is really kind of scary to me what they can tell about me and how I do surgery. So right. I would think, you know, five to ten years. That sooner. is... Uh, and maybe sooner. <laughs> that is amazing and, and scary. So, uh, but again, we want to thank Dr. John Lenahan for joining us. And uh, if you like, click on like. If you have comments and questions, go ahead and leave those for us. And, and we'll uh, post some slides too. That's right, we'll post some slides. So I appreciate you guys tuning in. Thank you. Thanks, Rick.